Okay, I'd like to welcome everyone tonight. Um, this is, I think this is probably the first time we've ever done a scholarship night like this. Um, the purpose for doing this is that, you know, every year we have seniors, upcoming seniors, and younger kids who have very similar questions every year about the scholarship process. Um, so tonight we want to dive into how do we answer some of those questions about how to go about getting scholarships, and how do we dive into it a little bit deeper to take advantage of um, the opportunities that are available to your kids as they move through this year. So I kind of want this to be as interactive as possible. Um, if you have questions going forward, we'll certainly have an opportunity at the end for you to ask questions, but if you have questions as we're proceeding, feel free to stop me and uh, ask anything that you have. So kind of the overview of what we're going to do tonight um, is when we go through the scholarship process, this is probably the most common question from seniors and common question from seniors starting in about March or April when they start thinking about, when they start getting their student aid reports and seeing how much money they're going to be owing out of pocket for the first year of college that year, that's when it becomes a real uh, priority. So these are the locations that we have to be accessing scholarships. There are a number of large scholarship databases that are available to kids nationwide. This has some positives and some negatives, and we'll talk a little bit more about them. Local organizations, this is one that's often overlooked. So Elks, Rotary, churches, firehouses, um, any group that you're uh, a member of or associated with, those are often sort of diamonds in the rough because a lot of times you will have those organizations that restrict uh, the accessibility to those scholarships to children of members or children of employees or children of associates, whatever the case may be. So there's oftentimes um, real high odds associated with applying for scholarships from organizations. The third spot is your college's student aid page. Depending on where your child decides to go, many schools have dedicated scholarships for students that attend that particular institution. Uh, and we'll go over some examples of what those look like. Um, one of my favorite ways to get scholarships, and I think one of the real diamonds in the rough in this process, is sort of cherry picking from other stu school student aid pages. The, um, a new trend in higher ed is that schools will publish the scholarships that their students have historically gotten. So they may not be, let's, let me use Texas A&M. It may not be a Texas A&M specific scholarship, but Texas A&M students over the last 5, 10, 15, fill in a number of years, have gotten that scholarship. So they'll provide a link to it. What it becomes for you is essentially a free database to go in, review scholarships, and click on and, and apply for some scholarships that you may not otherwise have found had you not looked there. And then we'll talk about, and really I think the bonus for you guys for why you're here tonight, uh, we'll talk about Belfont Senior Awards, which far and away provide the greatest odds and greatest opportunity for kids of Belfont High School to receive scholarship awards. The $75,000 scholarship program, the only people in the country eligible to receive those awards are the 186 Belfont High School seniors. So the odds, do the math, they're pretty good. Um, but we're going to talk about, and I'm gonna, we're going to roll out some a little bit different um, process for that uh, that you'll kind of get the, uh, you're going to get a bird's eye view of tonight. So let's start first with the big picture, the, the major scholarship databases. The good news about these, if you're familiar with them, it would be the fast webs of the world, the uh, Sally May, the big future on College Board. And I'll give you the links uh, in the next slide, and this whole presentation will be available on our webpage tonight, so you don't need to necessarily write the stuff down. It'll be linked available for you. But those, those websites aggregate a huge number of scholarships nationwide, billions of dollars in scholarships. So the good news is it's a huge pool to pick from. The bad news in that is that every single senior in North America has a FastWeb account. Every senior in North America has a College Board account. So there's a huge number of scholarships and there's a huge number of people attempting to acquire them. So <clears throat> 
the way that you attack a scholarship system like that is you have to think about what are most of the kids in the country going to be going for. Every kid in America is going to apply for the $10,000 scholarship they see on FastWeb. Every kid's going to apply for the $25,000 scholarship. You might be a very deserving student, but there's 1.2 million 4.0 students applying for this scholarship. The kids that are successful spend the bulk of their time on the lower dollar amount scholarships that are available on those big websites. So if you say, I'm not going to apply for any scholarship over $2,500, over $2,000, over, pick a number. You're going to be with a much smaller group of students applying for those same awards. Now, this is absolutely um, magnified exponentially. If you add into your search criteria, I'm only going to search for awards that are below X dollars and require some other piece of information from me, an essay, a, um, an art submission, something else, that, some action step that I have to do beyond that. That will significantly reduce the number of applicants. So, you know, I have in number two here, Don Shade was our FIA representative uh, for 30 years. And before he was with FIA, he was a, uh, a financial aid officer, and he had a student that would use FastWeb, and she, that was her criteria. Under 1,000 requires an essay. And the kid probably applied to 60, 70, 80 scholarships, but she got eight of them, and some of them were recurring. So in that strategy, and she wasn't a great student. She was like a 3-2 student, but she was a hard worker, and she was determined to get scholarship money. Um, she ended up with $8,400 in scholarship. I think 4,000 of it was revolving, means it was annually it, it um, continued. So the strategy can be a winning one, especially you know, even for students that maybe aren't the valedictorian in their class, but they're willing to go dig and, and do some work. In number three there, the more lines you throw in the water, the more fish you're likely to catch, and especially if you're throwing your lines in the pond that has fewer fishermen. So that's kind of the idea behind that. Here's my helpful tip. Before you sign up for FastWeb, before you sign up for Sally Mae, I would create a dedicated scholarship email. Because what will happen if you've, if you've already done it, you've seen it, um, once you sign up and create your profile, you're going to get notifications of emails, offers, all kinds of stuff. So if you have a personal email account, you're not going to want to get that cluttered up with a bunch of uh, incoming spam. Some of it's legitimate and some of it's spam, but you don't want it to be cluttering up your, your uh, personal email. So I have like a little example here of what I would add, sb, my initials, skull at gmail.com. So then I know everything going to the sb skull at gmail.com account that's going to be scholarship-related material, and I don't have to sift through my, my personal stuff to find it. Here are the major scholarship websites, and I've listed five of them. These four are listed on Ohio State University's page, and I added the Sally May component. Uh, but they're all, they're all dra drawing from essentially the same um, group of scholarships. So what you'll do is go to FastWeb, create an account, and then you create a FastWeb profile. Who are you? What are your demographics? What are you going to study? What's your GPA? And then they'll notify you of the scholarships that you qualify for. You can also dig a little further in there and, and go a little bit deeper. Uh, but if you look on the homepage here, you'll see the, when I say this is now taken center stage on their, their website, the no essay scholarship. Kids don't want to do, and it's not, you know, for better or for worse, they want to click a button and register, and that's the end of it. If you're willing to do more, you have a fighting chance to get additional money. So I won't go through each one of those websites, but I would encourage you to kind of navigate to them and, and take a look uh, at them for yourselves, see which ones you want to sign up for. Again, they're big. Um, I would encourage you to curtail your search so that you can get more out of it. But that's the first place to start. The second place, as we talked about, uh, local groups, national groups, fraternal groups, organizations that you're a part of. Um, as I said in, in the opening, these oftentimes will restrict um, those kids that are eligible. So we had a kid last year who searched out herself, Elks Scholarship, and through our local Elks chapter, she registered, 
and ended up with a $4,000 recurring scholarship. So it's out there, and it's available. And a lot of times, students, a lot of awards go with zero applicants. There's, there's kids that are eligible, but they either didn't know about it, they didn't apply, they didn't want to go through the steps, and so no money goes, uh, the money goes unclaimed. So don't overlook your local organizations, and I would include, as I said, your employment organizations with that. Okay, next stop, your college's student aid page. So depending on where you go, your school may have dedicated scholarships for the students of that school. So I'm gonna use Penn College as an example for you. This is Penn, Scho Penn College's scholarship listing page. Um, and these scholarships that are on this page are for Penn College students only. So I'll just go to the alphabetical listing and I'll start going down. I still haven't hit the bottom yet. These are all Penn College specific scholarships. So if you go to Penn College's page, you're gonna see a very, very rich um, number of scholarships available for their students. If you go to a Penn State University page, you're gonna see a very sparse offering of scholarships. Every school is different in the amount of money that they have eligible, dedicated for those students. Um, so I would encourage you, that's the first place. If you know that you're, if you're accepted to Penn College and you're going there, this is the first place that you'll look for Penn College scholarships. And for Penn College specifically, they have a Penn College scholarship application, so you log in with your username, put your stuff in, and then it's kind of like a common application almost for Penn College scholarships. But every school is different, but that's the first place you want to look. Okay, this is maybe my favorite um, way to attack scholarships. So, as I said, many schools will list on their page scholarships that kids have gotten. So, if we take a look at IUP's page, and I just pick three schools, you can... You know, there's 4,900 colleges and universities in America. You can go to just about any of their web pages and find scholarship ideas. So this is IUP. You can see outside scholarships and fellowships. That means not IUP specific. So if we go on their page and scroll down, you can see that we have just a tremendous number of scholarships that maybe their kids have received, maybe they're aware of, but it's another resource for you to find those scholarship monies that are available. Um, I also use, let me see if I can get it up here. Sometimes this Miami page doesn't load. Miami of Ohio has a PDF that's linkable. Um, so you can click on that. I don't think it's gonna load up, maybe it will. So here's Miami of Ohio's. And I'm gonna make it a little bigger for you. So you see the name, the deadline, the criteria, and a link. Every one of these is gonna look different, but every one of them is gonna provide you with um, additional ideas for scholarships and things that maybe, hopefully, in our case, because we know about these resources, hopefully these scholarships aren't included in something like a big future or a fast web. We don't wanna, we don't wanna find these outside scholarships that we find. We hope like heck that they're not there because that's gonna reduce the number of, of students that are applying. So that is the, the outside scholarship in a nutshell. Uh, again, if you have questions as we go at the end, let me know and we can dive into it a little bit deeper. This one is the one that is Belfont specific, so just for our kids. So the way this works, um, we have community members, former high school students, um, groups that have committed, at this point, over $75,000 for the class of 2014. Um, as I said, the only students are the 186 that are graduating this year. And these are the, the um, awards ranges from 50 to 5,000. We had one student last year that I think left the day with 12 or $13,000 in scholarships just from here. I think his total ended up somewhere around 24 when it was all said and done. Um, but the way the process works, is in March or April of this year, and it's really dependent. Our whole awards process is dependent on those that are endowing our scholarships. Once they've made the decision whether or not they're continuing or not, and they have until about, we give them until March 1st, but you know we're kind of at the mercy of, of those that are giving our kids money. So those tend to trickle in toward the end of March. As soon as we have the final list of who is endowing scholarships officially for this school year, 
then we'll publish the awards book for your kids, okay? The awards book will list every single scholarship available for Belfont High School students. My advice to your kids when they get that book is to get it, go through it, and highlight every award that they're eligible to apply for. For each award that they apply for, they will complete a separate standard application, handwritten in blue ink. Now, this becomes a point of contention every year. Why is that a requirement? Here's why. If we allowed students to complete one application and put in a photocopy, then we would have 250 awards times 186 applications for every single one. And that becomes an unmanageable task, number one. Number two, this benefits, this system benefits the students that are willing to do a little bit of extra legwork. They're willing to, you know, handwrite 50 or 60 applications. We've had, applic we've had awards where we had multiple eligible students, but only one or two that wanted to fill out the award. So it really, it's a gatekeeper role for those kids that are willing to go the extra mile. And the third reason is it's something that our sponsors absolutely insist on. They're, most of them, many of them are from the old school. They don't want to see computerized. They don't want to see photocopy. They don't want to see facsimile. They're the group that still writes people letters. They're the group that still sends postcards. So at the end of the day, it's their decision, and that's how we do it. But again, for you guys that are getting a head start on this, that could be a potential bonus for you. And I'll, show, I'll tell you why in a couple minutes. OK, there's a third group of awards, or I guess a second large overarching group of awards that require special applications. So every award in the catalog, regardless, requires a standard application. There's about 10 that require an additional special application. And most of these go directly to the family of the groups memorializing that, uh, the person that the award is for. And they're, in most cases, the people that make the decision ultimately about the award. So those can range from essays, letters of recommendation, attendance reports, transcripts, um, it really runs the gamut, and, and it's up to the individuals endowing that award. So, knowing this, what can this group do to prepare for that, uh, that time? What I'm going to do this year, how we're going to change this, is that the outcry in years past has been that the amount of time between the publishing of the book and the time those applications were due is very condensed, and it is. It's about two weeks between the time that we get final word from our sponsors and when the kids have to have their applications in. We're still selecting awards June 5th, 6th, and 7th, even with that timeline. So that's still going to be the case. The difference this year is we're going to make the application available much earlier. So the kids will have about six to eight weeks to be filling out applications. In addition, I'm going to put the archived awards book, which will look very similar to the 2014 awards book, but is not the official. But it'll give you a very good idea of what awards are out there, what the qualifications for those awards are, how many applications that your student will likely be looking at completing. So that's going to extend their time horizon for completing those awards. So let's say that your student was going to or is eligible for 60 of those awards in the book. In a normal year, they would have two weeks to complete that, which becomes really tough if they're a track athlete, if they're a, you know, in drama, if they have anything going on. It's midterms, it's keystones, it's whatever. There's all kind of stuff happening in the spring. So this is going to extend that. So someone that in two weeks would have had to do 30 a week, six a day, is now going to have eight weeks. Maybe they can do two applications a day. And just to give you an idea of what that looks like, here's what the 2013 application looked like. So, you know, it's pretty straightforward. Name of the award, the township you live in, elementary school. But you can see the extracurriculars, all that gets written by hand, and the next line, all that gets written by hand, the honors and awards. So. For students that are doing this, you know, there's real like carpal tunnel things happening if they're doing 60 in two weeks. 
So as I said, this extends that time horizon. They could get started on this as soon as we release the 2014 application, which I said will be late February, early March. So you know they can do their, their template application and then do at their leisure the number of applications that they'll need. So by the time the award book comes out, your student may have 30 or 40 of those standard applications completed already. Okay, so let's move to the... Okay, so we've talked about all of this. Um, here's a word to students. I talked about the families of those, endow, the, those that are endowing the award selecting them. The other folks that will select the winners of the awards are, there's a group of department chairs that select a number of them, but then a number of those awards go directly to the departments. So here, especially for the younger kids in the audience and the younger parents in the audience, the message is, you know, it is really important that you be engaged in your class, be noticed in your class. You know, be noticeable, be remarkable, be, re be someone that is going to stand out and that your teachers, when three, four years down the line, when they're sitting around a round table talking about eligible students, remember that student was a really, a really sharp student in my class. They really participated. They were not afraid to voice their opinion. They were not afraid to get engaged in the material. Those are things that teachers remember. And at the end of the day, your teachers are going to be the ones that make probably about half of the determinations about these awards. The piece that I think most kids overlook in this is especially the Memorial Awards. We have the Matt Fenstey Fenstermacher Award, the Phil Adams Award. Um, you know, there, there are so many of the awards in our catalog that are Memorial Awards to people that, that other people really cared about. So, and their families are making the determination about the winner. If your kids spend a little bit of time, just a little bit, especially for the older folks in this group, to understand who Matt Fenstey Fenstermacher was. How did he pass away? What did he do? What was important to him? When they send their scholarship application to that family, it has a heck of a lot more meaning than just some standard, I should win this award because. So from a strategic standpoint, and not to be manipulative, but I mean, that is something that will really be meaningful to that family. And will probably ultimately, for your child, play well in you know, what the ultimate decision is on that award. So that, that's, a, that's a piece of advice that I think everyone benefits from. I think that you're more likely to get selected for an award, and these awards then become much more meaningful and important for those families that maybe haven't heard someone talk about their deceased son like that for 20 years. Um, these links will be important to you. I put them up tonight. Um, the first is our website award. The second is the archived awards book. So this is what the link looks like. This link right here will take you to the publisher file that has, this is the book that has every single one of our Belfont Senior Awards listed in it. So this is kind of the, uh, the setup that you'll have. Let me expand this a little bit. So you can see for the Next Step Scholarship, it's going to give you the requirements. It will tell you the sponsor, and then it will have the amount. If there is an asterisk next to the name, that means it requires a special application. The next link on the PowerPoint that I have up for you, I've archived. These publisher files always don't cooperate. The special app page links to all of the special applications that we've had in the past. And I'll pull one up. I know that's not, very, that re not resolving very well. But this will show you what the specific special application for the Jim and Kathy Brown Award is. So for that award, you're going to have to do the following. And it will list out for you what those things are. Here's the application list all the activities, and then have some comments. And they've got their own special application that you create for that. Some of them will have essay topics. Some of them will um, ask you to do get letters of recommendation, things like that. But I'm archiving this so that you can go through each one of these special applications and see what's going to be necessary. 
to help you kind of plan out how much time you're going to have to allot to do these things. Again, these aren't the final application formats for 2014. A lot of them haven't changed in 10 years. So you can be pretty confident that they're going to be pretty close to what you're seeing up here. Um, and the very last one that I have is our scholarship FAQ page. It's kind of a light version of what we talked about tonight. Um, for years, it got to the, the point where my students, um, it, it got to be such a frequent question that I asked that I created this page to hopefully answer 90% of the questions right off the bat. Um, if there's additional questions with scholarships, if they've read this page, I know they've at least had the basics and we're not going to rehash the same questions over and over. So as I said, that's kind of a light version of tonight. For you guys, I would refer back to the PowerPoint. It's a little bit more detailed. Uh, and then finally, on our website, if you want to link back to this, I am right now actually going to activate this PowerPoint on the website so you can download that at any point um, at your leisure. Finally, before I conclude, this is what I would suggest. Um, you know, we've, we've talked throughout the night that the more time and, and energy you can put into this and the more um, properly dedicated time and energy you can put into it, the more beneficial it can be. So I would suggest setting up some kind of routine. If you're really serious about going after scholarships, do it for 30 minutes a week, do it two times, uh, two times a week for two hours, do it during study hall every single day. If you don't use your study hall and you listen to your iPod all day, here's a very productive task that you can undertake during your study hall. And it gets you about three hours of scholarship searching per week times 30 weeks. That's almost 100 hours of scholarship searching. So, but the more effort you can put in, the more, the more benefit you'll reap. Don't try to do it over a weekend. Don't try to write an essay for one of these contests in five minutes because they're going to get a lot, and they'll be able to tell the people that just scratched something together to get it in and someone that actually put thought into it. We have a large history, or a long history, of students in this building getting outside scholarships that require additional materials. We have $1,000, $2,000, $5,000 winners. We've had, I think, six different winners over the last decade of the Edgar Snyder Award, which was, requires some type of submission in some form, be it on I think most of the years it's the topic is drunk driving. Um, but I can remember three winners in the last five years. So those that, that really put the time into it, think about it, are thoughtful about it, and plan, have a very good opportunity to get scholarships. So that's all I have in general terms. Is there anything specific, uh, any questions that you guys have that, that we can answer? beyond what we talked about tonight. Yeah. Okay. So on my website, or on our district, on our department website, and so let me just take you from, if you go, to, if you navigate to the high school webpage to start, and then on departments, school counseling, and then on the left-hand side, we have a number of links. I put all the scholarship links down here at the bottom. So the bottom four are scholarship related. The very last one will link to this PowerPoint. You're welcome. Anyone else? Come on up. I got another talk. This one right here? Okay. So there are some additional scholarships that, that we've, if we have scholarships that come into us or that we've had students in past years that um, have received, the Burger King Scholars Award is a great example. The Burger King Scholars Award is a $1,000 award. Every Burger King franchise in America gets to give away one Burger King Scholars Award. We have kids every year, we probably have 10 or 20 kids that apply. Last year we got three Burger King Scholar Awards because the Burger King and Milesburg, the Bald Eagle kids, none of them applied. They gave their scholarship to us. One of the state college ones on the Benner Pike, nobody applied. They gave it to us. So we kind of have like the market cornered on the Burger King Scholar Awards. And I think my last graduating class in 2009, I had a student that had a 2.6 GPA get a $1,000 Burger King Award, a 3.3, 3, 
and I, he couldn't have been, the other one couldn't have been more than a 3-0. So these are not like off the charts great students by the books, you know, but they took the time to put in, put all the information in, and they're great examples of students that, you know, through that time and energy, uh, were able to, to, to get really, I mean, a thousand dollar scholarship is more scholarships than I ever got in my life, so. Um, so yeah, use all, all means at your disposal. He, the most important thing that I could tell you tonight, I didn't put in this PowerPoint, I didn't tell you, and it just occurred to me. Every year, there are people that are preying on senior parents and students' parents with scholarship scams of some kind. There are scams that sound so legitimate that there's someone going to come from the bank and do, I mean, they're a suit and tie, it's everything. Bottom line, if you have to pay money for a scholarship, it is not a scholarship. Do not do it. I can't be more plain than that. Scholarships are free money for you. If a scholarship requires that you have some action step of transferring funds, it is a scam. Do not do it. I had uh, a family, a very well-educated mother and father, who had their second child graduating last year. He, in 2009, he got an email from me about that very topic. I hadn't sent the last one out last year for that group. But he said he was about five inches from signing on with one of those groups. And he said, it just kept ringing in my ears, don't pay for scholarships, don't pay for scholarships. And thank God, he didn't end up doing it. But it turned out to be, of course, a scam. And it would have you know, cost their family a great deal of money. So just if you remember nothing else from tonight, do not pay one red cent for any scholarship. Thanks for reminding me of that. I don't even have to. Yeah. So that's a really good question, Chris. So for the, most of the scholarships available are available for, for high school students anyway, or available for high school seniors. So there's not going to be a lot of added value in searching, per se, for scholarships that you're going to apply for. The added value that you'll achieve from doing a little bit of a search and in getting involved in this process now is knowing what the criteria are that will be scored. Planning for that, I mean, scholarships don't just happen. You don't wake up on May 1st of your senior year and say, I'm ready to get a scholarship. You have to have had a body of work in some way. That doesn't mean you have to be a 4-0 student, but you, had to, you have to have done something through that time that would warrant someone giving you their money for educational purposes. Now, that can be a number of things. That can be you, you know, are, a, are an okay student, but you are... I mean, you were involved in the choir for the last five years. You built sets. Um, you were the stage manager for four years. Here are all the things I learned as being a stage manager. That might be your essay, the things I learned as a stage manager. And someone's going to read that and say, damn, that's, I've never heard that before. That is a really sharp essay. I don't care that that kid has a 3-3. That is a great essay, and that's someone that I want to reward. Now, the other awards may be you've got to have a 4-0, and send that essay. So it's really, it's very educational to see what kinds of things they're going to be reviewing, especially, and I mean maybe more so than anything, for the Belfont Awards program. Because those things, I mean, unless something drastic changes, these awards have pretty much been very, very similar for the last, as long as I've been here, that's 10 years. So if you know the awards that you're going to be eligible for when you're a senior, that might inform some of your choices, some of the way that you carry yourself throughout the day, some of the events and, and things that you get involved with in school. So I think that's how it can be a little bit more you know, educational and helpful for younger parents. If for the, younger par for the parents of incoming seniors, yes, I would say that the earlier in that process after the junior year that you start, the better. Because you'll get a lot of the stuff that closes early that maybe others have missed. 
Um, and you'll, again, extend that time horizon to the point that you don't have to be doing. If you're going to apply for 100 awards, you can do over a nine-month period or a six-month period. You can do that you know, one or two a day rather than you know, try to do 10 or 20 or 30 over a weekend. Other questions? Yes. Great, great question, Liz. Again, where Belfont Awards sort of trump everyone else. So I'll use the Wetzlers, for example. Um, a lot of schools, and, and schools where you would go into a national database and get an award, uh, those will go, most, in most cases, directly to the school where you're going that will then you know, reduce, that they'll be calculated in your financial aid package. So. If you're going to a private school that's going to have to offer you a lot of aid on their own, then what they'll typically do is, if they were going to give you 10,000 and you have 2,500 scholarships, now they're going to give you 7,500. Not everyone does that, but it certainly could happen. So the Wetzlers, knowing that, what John having been a counselor for many years, they make their awards out in the name of the student. It's the reason we don't call our night Belfont Scholarship Night. We call it Belfont Awards Night. So that way, if I win the award, John cuts me a check for $1,500, I could use it to go buy groceries or I could use it to pay for school. But either way, it's not going to impact my financial aid. It's not going directly to that school. So we have a lot of our, and we try to encourage those people that are, are open to that option to encourage them to do that for our kids for that very reason. So that it, Some of them go directly to the school. Indicated in the book, I don't think that's indicated in the book. Um, I'll have to ask Carol. I'm, I'm sure it's not indicated in the book. Um, it would be an interesting addition, though, in a color coding or some sort of notation that would indicate whether the award goes to the student or the school. I mean, you can always decline an award, but I mean, it, it's not really to your. It's not really going to going to negatively impact you. If you were going to get ten thousand. You have a $2,500 scholarship, and they're only going to give you $7,500. You end up with the same. But you have upside. Right. No, definitely. Right. So some of those folks, I mean, the people that are endowing these awards are our community members, are people that went to our school, that live in our community. So, you know, the other thing is if an award is, is won, you might be able to negotiate that with, uh, with the, you know, understand your, understanding your specific situation if you're in that situation how it would benefit you to have that directly to the student rather than to the school. Very good question. Other question? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, so I'm a story guy, right? So like I, I, I've been in these, these meetings, you know, I'm one of the department chairs, so I sit in and I see these, you know, the, the determinations for these awards. And the kids that, you know, let's say, I'll, I'll just give you a, a, a look at how, I'll, I'll give you a look inside the door. So we have, let's say conservatively, 100 awards to assign our job as department chairs, there's 100 awards. So we have 100 awards and we keep having these like lists of 35 kids come in. So what's gonna happen is the department chair is gonna sit around and they're gonna nominate. Okay, from that list I nominate X. So it might not necessarily be getting noticed as in like doing jumping jacks in class, but people can get noticed in lots of different ways. Either through the quality of work. You know, if you have a student that just, they're a great, you know, they're a great mind, but they just have a real aversion to, you know, speaking in public or whatever. I mean, best case scenario, they overcome that aversion and, you know, whatever. But in, in lieu of that, that's not always possible. So they may be able to show their talents in another way. And that means when I hand in work to this instructor, to this department chair, to this teacher, I'm going to make sure that my work is quality work. Teachers can tell when students did their work on the bus 
and when they spent a time at home and edited it and went through and, and really put a quality piece of, of you know, their own creative thought on the page. So if you're constantly doing that, that registers with teachers. Like this kid produces good work. This kid is, you know, he cares about his education or she cares about her education. So in those ways, you know, that's how I think each student's got to find their own way to communicate that, um, you know, because that stands out from, you know, what, you know, kids get a bad rap a lot of the time, you know, with, you know, their, their stereotypes, especially of this age group, and their, the stereotype is on their iPod texting this and that. If you can distinguish yourself from that student in some way, like you're not just the run of the mill whatever, you, you are great at X, you're great at Y, you're great at Z. You don't have to be great at X, Y, and Z. Pick a letter and be great at it, okay? Yep, other questions? Okay, um, I would invite you, I don't even know if I introduced myself when I started this, I apologize. Uh, my name is Sean Barbro, um, sbarbro at basd.net. Uh, contact information is on the website. If you need to ask any questions about any of this stuff, contact me, contact Mr. Willis, mwillis at basd.net. We would be happy to, you know, engage any of the questions that you have, especially, you know, when you go through this process, there, there comes uh, very specific pointed questions that may just be unique to your specific child. And if you need to bounce it off someone, we're certainly more than happy to, to hear that question and, and give our input. So. Thank you all for coming. As I said, if you have any questions going forward, don't hesitate to contact us. And the, um, what I hope to do by the grace of our videographer, Carla Weaver, uh, is also to archive this uh, presentation as well. Carla's come to tape it. So if you want to look back through any of the stuff or you know, review any of what we've talked about tonight, I'm going to have it. Carla will, is usually pretty good about turning that around in about a week on our YouTube page. So we'll send out the link to you as well if you want to review this at a later time. Thank you very much for coming. Have a great night.